go ahead and turn that on for the folks at home. So, being a pastor and a preacher and a teacher, as a church, we grow the most when we work our, th our way through Scripture in an expository fashion, which is why I'm so adamant about preaching through books of the Bible. But as a family, um, I've received some feedback that that's great, but if we could take breaks every now and then, that would be even better. And so I listened, and that was a good suggestion. And so what we've been doing is we've been working our way through 1 Timothy, and then we're in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. We've also been working our way through Ecclesiastes uh, at the request of another church member, right? And so we've been kind of going back and forth. And then as the need arises, we'll do a topical sermon as needed. Amen. So it's kind of what we're doing. <clears throat> what sparked me to go back to 1 Timothy today is there's been a lot of fuss. And I don't, this is going to be on our YouTube channel. I don't really want to name names or anything like that. But there's a, a well-known pastor that just recently took on the title of apostle. Some of you may know who I'm talking about. If you don't, that's okay. And we get, I think sometimes in the church, we can get so caught up with titles, right? We can get so caught up with titles. I'm not just brother so-and-so, I'm pastor so-and-so. Please refer to me as pastor or whatever right? That's not me. If you want to call me Eric or Brother Eric, that's fine. If you feel a conviction to call me pastor, it's going to be humbling for me, but I'll, if that's what you feel the Lord is leading you to do, then you can do that. Brother Eric with me is fine. Um, you have other people that are like, I'm not just a sister so-and-so, I'm title so-and-so, right? And we can get so caught up in the titles and they're important or they wouldn't be in scripture. But I think like anything else, it depends on where your heart is at, right? If you desire that power, if you desire that title, um, just because you feel like it's gonna set you above other people, that's a wrong motivation to get a, a title to work towards something. Amen? That's a wrong motivation. Nine times out of 10, and this is just kind of a general statement, and I hope I don't upset anyone, but nine times out of 10, if you're seeking a title, you're probably not called for it. Does that make sense? All the greatest leaders I've ever seen throughout history and in my own personal life and in the life of the church and if you disagree with me, that's okay. But all the best leaders I've ever known personally or seen or, or been around didn't want that title. They saw that there was a need and they felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit to fill that need. And the church, along with you know the Holy Spirit, they said, yes, this person would serve good in this role. So people that seek out power and titles, we got to be very careful about those kinds of people. So recently we had someone take on the title of apostle, not here, but just a known pastor. And that office isn't available today. <laughs> to Biblically, to be an apostle, you had to spend time with Jesus in the flesh or have a vision of Jesus after the resurrection, right? Or interact with him after the resurrection. And so an exception would be Paul. I don't want to get into this too much, but since we're talking about church leadership, I felt like it's important to just kind of say that, you know, there's no apostles today. At least that's my view when I look at scripture. Um, the apostles were the foundation of the church. The foundation's been laid, right? 
And so we need to approach these things with humility. Amen. Y'all are half asleep this morning. So we're going to continue on uh, with what scripture says about church leadership. And we're going to be in 1 Timothy 3, but we're also going to be primarily in Acts chapter 6, okay? So kind of put your thumb or a piece of paper or something in your Bibles and be ready to kind of turn back and forth. But primarily we will be in Acts and you'll see why here in just a minute. So the big idea about all of this is if the church is going to display the glory of Christ in its worship and witness, a model of church leadership based on the word of God is absolutely necessary. If we're going to be a church that honors God and represents properly to the world what church is, is all about, we're going to have a biblical view of church and we're going to live that out. And so, if you don't mind, let's go ahead and read 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. Um, let's stand if you're able to honor the reading of God's word. This is the word of God this morning. 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 10. It says, Deacons likewise, I'm going to pause there. Who were we talking about before? Elders, overseers, shepherds, right? The words are interchangeable. So now in verse 8, we see Paul moving to deacons. It says, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is Christ Jesus. Father, please bless the reading of your word today. Help us to have a biblical understanding of deacons and live that out here in our local body of believers known as Providence. We want you to be glorified in everything that we say and do here. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, we see a list of requirements for being a deacon. Do you know what's not so clear is the responsibilities of a deacon, right? So we see the qualifications, but the responsibilities, we've not yet seen like specifics on that, right? And so if you look at the book of Acts, the book of Acts paints a picture of the early church. And see, honestly, there's not a whole lot about deacons mentioned there, right? And somebody said this, a commentator said this, the fact that deacons aren't highlighted in the New Testament may be one reason we've got a variety of opinions about the role of deacons today. Now, those of us that have been members of different churches or visited different churches and been around, you know, the church environment, You'll know churches vary in, in what their deacons do, their responsibilities, their roles. Um, and we're going to take a look at as to why that is. Um, the other thing is that sadly, some churches have an unbiblical practice when it comes to deacons. We've been talking a lot here at, at Providence since we have been growing. I mean, I know we got a lot of people out today a lot of families aren't here for whatever reason yeah but as we grow as more people visit and come in and decide to join and they want to, to help us you know spread the gospel um we're going to grow and we're going to need to appoint other people to be leaders in our church right and so that's why we're driving discipleship hard we have wednesdays um 
where we do men's and women's and, and youth and children's ministries now. We got that going. Oh, I'm smiling at me. <laughs> so it's important that we do things right as a church. It's important that um, everybody that's called to do what they do actually do what they're called to do. And we don't have deacons doing things they're not supposed to be doing. Elders doing things they're not supposed to be doing. Does that make sense? Uh, women doing things they're not supposed to be doing. Men doing things they're not supposed to be doing. So this is very important that we talk about this. <clears throat> and so we need to put into practice what we do know about deacons from Scripture, since there's some things we don't know for sure. So the first thing I want to do is some of you may be saying, what even is a deacon? Right? Like I've, I've heard the term, but I don't really know what that is. And here's a working definition. In the New Testament, the word usually translated serve is the Greek word diakoneo, which literally means through the dirt. It refers to an attendant, a waiter, or someone who ministers to another. From this word, we get the English word deacon. The word for deacon almost always refers to some form of ministry or service. So a deacon is a servant, right? Do y'all remember the Mother's Day sermon where we talked about how when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, he dignified humble service. Do you remember that? Where before people would look at the washing of someone's feet and be like, I ain't doing that. Right? And then Jesus does it. And you look at it now and you're like, I want to be like Christ. I want to love people like Jesus loved. If he's washing feet, I want to wash feet. Does that make sense? There are so many things, little things here and there that people do in our church that mean a lot. There's a lot of people, my wife is, because she knows, a lot of you do stuff behind the scenes that the whole church doesn't know about. And every person in the church body, every member of the church is important. I can't stress that enough. Some have titles, some have Sunday school teacher, youth worker, pastor, deacon, elder, right? You know what the most important title is? Child of God. Am I better than any of you just because there's pastor? And no, I'm not. I'm not. Every single person in this body has something God has called them to do. And if they don't do it, the church suffers. The church suffers. So let's keep going. The same word deacon is used in Ephesians 4.12, and it means the work of the ministry. Let's take a look. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's where that word is, right? A deacon. A deacon-related word is in there. For building up the body of Christ. Okay, so this is so important. All followers of Christ are commanded to be servants. We are commanded to serve each other. In fact, you serve God by serving each other. Amen? Where's all my amens? We are all called to be servants. We are commanded to be servants. It's not an option. It's not an option. Some are called to, uh, and commanded to lead others to serve. What do I mean by that? Jess, I hope I don't embarrass you, but I love you, man. Jess gets a lot of stuff done around here. Lynn, I would add Lynn to that. Janet, I mean, I mean you all do, but I'm, I'm picking on Jess here for just one second because I love him. Jess gets a lot of stuff done around here. The women's bathroom, uh, the work that's going on out there. Do you know who called and got pricing and materials and, and hired the labor and is working out the budget? Not me. I'm not doing any of that. You know why? 
I'm doing this. I'm doing this. God's called me to study his word and preach the gospel and share the gospel and equip you all to go out and share the gospel with people and to minister to people, right? There's a lot that wouldn't get done if Justin didn't take that on himself and say, you can't do this, brother Eric. You're doing other things. I'm gonna go ahead and do this. And thank God for you, Jess. There's a lot that wouldn't get done. So let me drive this home. This is, this is what I wanted to say about um, some are called and commanded to lead others to serve. Let's say there's a, a project at church and Jess is up to his eyeballs trying to get this done. And he notices that uh, Justin's available and Justin has some background and he approaches Justin and says, Justin, and he tells him of the situation and says, can you help me with this? Can you help me bear a little bit of this, a little bit of this burden to make sure that this gets done? And Justin's like, yeah, man. And I know Justin in real life, I know Justin thinks very highly of Jess. And if Jess were to ask Justin for help, I know Justin would be like, yeah, man, and he'd do whatever. So you see a leader leading others to serve. Jess is setting the example by leading in that, but then he goes and approaches others that can serve and leads them to serve. It's beautiful when it's done right. When it's done in a biblical way, it's absolutely beautiful. Let's look at Acts. Go ahead and turn over to Acts. And we're gonna be in chapter six, verses one through seven. And I'm gonna go ahead and read this. <clears throat> Everybody there? If not, it will be on the screen. So it says this about deacons and acts. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit and Philip. And uh, I always get these names so crazy. Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas. It sounds like a cheese you would put on spaghetti. I'm sorry. I hope he does, isn't in heaven getting offended, but I would like some Parmenas cheese with my spaghetti, please. And Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. You see what's going on here? Let's see. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Dale's not here. I, I was thinking of Dale all week when I was preparing for this. I was hoping he'd be here so I could use him as an illustration. Do y'all know what Dale does now? He does roofing, right? He's a consultant. He climbs up on roofs and makes sure the insurance is doing right by people and all, all that. So that Dale works in roofing, right? Let's say we had a widow in our congregation whose roof was falling apart. She has no money and the church can help. Right? Picture that in your mind. Would it make sense <laughs> for me to delegate that to Dale? Or would it make sense for me to say, I'll take care of that deal. You preach the word on Sunday. Do you know what Dale's going to say to me? You're out of your mind. I'm not preaching the word. 
Amen. He's not at a place where he's going to do that yet. He's, he's not at a place where he feels called or, or convicted to, to do that right now. He can fix a roof. Now, he can fix a roof better than I can fix a roof. That's not what I do. It's not what I do. So what if Dale came to me and said, Brother Eric, let me help with Miss So-and-So's roof. I'll take care of that. I'll lead people to help out. And then that way you can still counsel people, prepare the messages for the week and everything. That's going to free you up to do that. Let me do this. Is this starting to fill itself out and make sense? Is it? Y'all are awful quiet this morning. And so in verses one through four, a form of the word deacons is used three times in just that little passage. In verses one and two, this terminology is applied to those who were responsible for leading others to serve. There it is again. This is why deacons are referred to as leading servants. Leading servants. Servants who lead others to serve. Amen. It's so important. Now, throughout the rest of the book of Acts, we don't see uh, the word or the title of deacon. But we do see is two primary, uh, what we do see is two primary leadership roles in Acts. The first one is the elders. Okay, we see these two groups. Uh, the elders is the group of men responsible primarily for prayer and the ministry of the word. They're the preachers, the teachers, the counselors, right? Now the deacons, that group is responsible primarily for serving in specific areas of service. And again, getting others to serve. So it raises the question, so what specifically do deacons do? What specifically, right? We know that the elders, they teach, they preach, they counsel. What, what do deacons do specifically? And we're going to dive into that in just a minute. But first, we need to have a couple things in mind as we go forward with this. Um, we want to clear our minds of any unbiblical thoughts we have about deacons. I think any of us that have been in church any number of years, we've seen deacons gone wild. <laughs> deacons gone wild, man. Right? Deacons doing things they shouldn't be doing, having authority that they don't have biblically, trying to run the show. Deacons that think they're the supervisors of the pastor and the other leaders, and what they say goes, this is their... This is their church, right? That is a very unbiblical view of deacons. And if you have that view, repent. Let's get it right. Let's get it based on what the Bible teaches. Okay? We need to just get rid of all the unbiblical tradition and, and focus on what Scripture says about deacons. One commentator said, some people think deacons are a group of men in the church who meet together and complain about the pastor and other church leaders or how things are being done or not being done in the church. That's a shame. That's a shame. And I would dare say if you're someone that does that and you got the title of deacon and you cause disunity in your church, you have no right being a deacon. You're not ready yet. Get your heart right first and then maybe later you'll be called to be a deacon. If you're causing disunity in the church, you have no right being a leader in the church. And that goes for everybody, not just deacons. It goes for me and everybody else. This is why we desperately need a biblical view of deacons. So to gain a biblical view, we need to look at what these leading servants did in Acts chapter six and how they're described in 1 Timothy 3, uh, 3 8 through 13. So what we're going to do real quick is we're going to look at three responsibilities of deacons that we find in Scripture, right? Remember, there's a lot we're not going to know because it's just not there. And there's a reason for that. But for now, let's look at what we do know. So responsibility number one is this. Deacons are to meet needs according to the word of God. Deacons are to meet needs according to the word. 
The primary role of deacons is spiritual service aimed at meeting specific needs that arise from specific circumstances. So the needs can change as circumstances change, right? As the need arises, deacons may need to step up and say, well, I can take care of that. And then when that gets taken care of and the need is met and God is glorified, then something else may come up where the deacon says, okay, you know, this other person is, you know, we have a leak at the church. Well, I'm not a plumber. I am. And he's a deacon. Guess what, deacon so-and-so? Can you make sure our plumbing issue at the church gets taken care of? Or can you make sure the plumbing issue at this widow's home gets taken care of? She doesn't have any money. No family. This is what we're talking about here. This is why, this is why, to answer that question, this is why you don't see specifics in scripture because the needs may change. The needs may change as circumstances change. So the example that we see in Acts 6 is the distribution of aid or resources as the church grew. Uh, looking after widows, right? The widows were being neglected and the need arose for uh, leading servants to lead others to serve and make sure the need was met. You wanna have, you wanna hear some examples that I thought of? Sure, Brother Eric. I hear crickets chirping. Here's some examples I thought of of how deacons can serve, right? And help out in the church. You ready? It's funny how professional I made this sound in my outline. I said other examples could be, uh, but are not limited to. <laughs> Building and grounds maintenance, business and administrative tasks, managing church finances, heading up the church bus ministry, repairing vehicles for people that can't afford a mechanic, uh, church parking ministry, right? You see that in a lot of churches. Um, church security. One church that I know of in the area, their men's ministry is really good at building handicap ramps. Handy, did I say that right? Handicap ramps. People that are now handicapped that need a ramp built at their home because they're now in a wheelchair. They go and they their church pays for the materials and everything and they're they, you got a free wheelchair ramp. Amen. How much did that mean to you? That's just beautiful, man. That's beautiful. When we can minister and meet needs in the name of Christ for his namesake and for his glory and get the gospel out there that way, it's just absolutely beautiful. And the list goes on and on and on. And that's why there's no specifics in scripture because it could be any number of different things. So deacons, are, and I put in parentheses, any other believer for that matter. So this goes for all of us. Need to serve willingly and be happy to do so. And this verse really, I'm gonna be transparent with you. This verse always convicts me when I read it. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Am I the only one that struggles with doing some things without grumbling and complaining? We're to do all things without grumbling or complaining. I was at a church one time, and I'm not. I was at a church one time, and there was a new pastor there. And some people had called out because they had a, one had a family crisis, I think, or something like that. And they, they weren't there to drive the bus. And there was about 30 to 40, well, about, there's a lot of kids in the neighborhood that relied on the bus ministry to get to church. And they needed someone to drive the bus 
And the only person that was available was the new pastor. And the several in the congregation watched in just utter disbelief as the pastor threw a fit in front of everybody because he had to drive the bus one Wednesday night. You remember that? And we were all kind of like, really? Really? And that's when a lot of us were like, I think we're in trouble with, yeah. And so, I've seen, I've seen some of y'all and I've seen what you do behind the scenes. And when you think I'm not looking or you think nobody's looking, I see you bend over and pick up the Kleenex, the soiled Kleenex that somebody accidentally left in a pew. I see you pick it up and throw it away, right? We gotta have servants hearts, you guys. If, if we're gonna reach a lost and dying world for Jesus Christ, we have to have a servant's heart. It's, it's, the old, it's the old way of looking at things. Like if, if you're a supervisor at a job or a manager, don't ask your, your people that work for you. Don't ask them to do things you're unwilling to do yourself. One of the best, one of the best managers I ever worked for in my whole entire life as an adult, his name is Chris Barnes. And we're still friends to this day. It's been years since I worked for him. Hands down, best manager I ever worked for. Do you know why? If something needed to be done, I was a facilities manager and he was over me. He was the guy in the office that told everybody else what to do. Extremely knowledgeable though. I was at the district office, so I was his facilities manager there. And if something needed to be done, this is so great. If something needed to be done, do you remember? And I didn't know how to do it. I'd go back to the district office. Hey, Eric, what's going on? Chris, this has to be done. This is the situation I'm in. I don't know how to do this. Give me 30 minutes. And that man, that young man, would grab his tool belt and come right out there with me on the floor or in the ceiling or on the roof or wherever it was. And he would work right alongside me and teach me how to do what needed to be done. And he would do it with a joyful, thankful heart. Never once did he yell at me, you're supposed to know how to do this, you know, or anything like that. He'd be like, give me just a few moments and I'll help you. And there was like, I think 10 of us in this district, and he was like that with all of us. He never asked us to do something that we weren't willing to do ourselves. And my respect for Chris Barnes till this day is just through the roof. When that guy asked me to do anything that needed to be done, I did it. You know why? Because I loved Chris. He was a good boss. He took care of us. He looked out for us. He was awesome. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. He could have complained the whole time, right? I shouldn't have to help you with this. Never did that. Never did that, not once. Let's not do that in the church, okay? Let's not, let's not do that in the church. Deacons are to support the ministry of the word. This is the second responsibility. Deacons are to support the ministry of the word of the word. In Acts 6, we see the apostles being taken away from their overall leadership responsibilities. Do you remember what that was? Prayer and the proclamation of the word? Uh, because the widows were being overlooked in the distribution of food. Again, it goes back to the roofing illustration I used. I'm not good at repairing roofs. Dale is. What makes more sense? Dale's not going to want to teach the word. <laughs> not right now, not at this point in his faith, right? So he would say to me, Brother Eric, you, you preach and do what you do. I'm going to go do this because I'm better at it, right? My gifts are more suited to take care of this. 
Okay, so here's what we see. To free up the apostles' availability for preaching and teaching, deacons were appointed. And this is a quote from a commentary. We see then the balance that God intends for his church. Listen to this. To be fully devoted to the word and fully devoted to meeting needs in the world. The church needs individuals who are devoted to both of these tasks. We got to be devoted to the word and devoted to service, right? To serving, to people. The vital role that deacons have in the church is that they are leading servants. They serve elders who are servant leaders so they can lead. Preaching, teaching, counseling. Everyone in our church is so important. It's so important. Here's what we don't see in the church or in scripture. Here's what we don't see in scripture. Unfortunately, in some churches, we do see this. And it's sad and it's heartbreaking. You know what's sad and heartbreaking? When you see the deacons and the elders in some twisted power struggle in a church. Amen? That should never be. Who's in charge of his church? Christ. Who falls under Christ's authority? Elders, deacons, everybody else, right? Shouldn't we all be on the same page? Shouldn't there be unity? There should be unity. And so what you don't see in scripture is a power struggle between the deacons and, and, and elders. It's unbiblical and it causes disunity in the church. It can hurt a church. It can destroy churches. Again, deacons not only serve elders so they can lead, so the elders can lead, they lead others so they can serve. Deacons set that example, right? They reach out, they help other people recognize their gifts and serve the church. Number three, number three. Deacons are to unify the body around the word. The other thing we notice in Acts 6, uh, physical neglect was causing spiritual disunity and Christ followers were starting to complain about each other. And this will only make a bad situation worse. When we have a need, there's a situation that needs to be resolved. Needs aren't being met. The last thing we need to do is start gossiping about each other, talking bad about each other, putting each other down, blaming each other, right? Playing the blame game. Is that gonna help or hinder us? Who gets the victory in the church when we behave that way? The enemy. Our enemy loves to destroy churches. He loves it. He loves hindering what we're called to do. Deacons were appointed to help ease the tension and disunity rising up in the church. Has anyone ever heard the, the expression, you know, what are you doing, brother? You know, what are you doing, Eric? I'm working a job. Oh, I'm putting out fires this morning. <laughs> Anybody ever heard that? I'm putting out fires. What does that mean? Problems that are coming up and then people are freaking out and not behaving right and blaming each other. And it, Well, we got to put out that fire. Amen. That's what deacons are supposed to do. That's what deacons are called to do. So in Acts, we see that there was tension. And what do they do? They appoint deacons to help. They appoint deacons to help. So what we see in scripture is deacons laboring to meet needs and promote unity in the body of Christ. Listen to this. Uh, one commentator said that some have referred to deacons as the shock absorbers of the church. I remember when Jamie and I were part of a church plant uh, in Indiana and the church plant started growing. My official title was the associate pastor. But a lot of stuff that I did because our church was smaller was I would step in and, and do a lot of things that you could say the deacon would do, Right. And so one of the things I would try to do is when there was a problem and there was backbiting and disunity and people were mad at, at my friend Judd and he was the senior pastor, you know what Brother Eric would do? I was the shock absorber. 
I go in there and I talk to these people behind the scenes and say, what's wrong? You okay? And they would say to me, you know, well, Judd's doing this and blah, blah, blah. And our pastor, blah, blah, blah. And I would say, do you know why he's doing that? And as long as it wasn't something confidential, I could explain to them, this is why we're headed in this direction. This is how, oh, why well, didn't know that? Okay, well, now that you do know that, you think you can get behind them? Yeah, I can do that. Problem solved. What would happen if I would have said, yeah, I can't stand him either? That jerk. What would happen then? Nothing godly. I'll tell you that. Number four, the qualifications of deacons. What are the qualifications? This is where we turn back to uh, 1 Timothy 3, 8 through, two, 8 through 13. <clears throat> I'm just going to put it up on the screen for you. Deacons need to have a mission mindset. And what is the mission? To make the gospel known in all nations, all over the world. They're going to do whatever it takes according to scripture without grumbling or complaining or backbiting or gossiping to make it happen. The focus is on what's, more, what's most important, seeing people come to faith in Christ. Amen? God is the number one priority. The gospel is the number one priority. The enemy is going to do everything in his power to cause disunity in the church to hinder the mission. You know what the good news is, though, is that God has given us everything we need to have victory over the enemy. Amen. Y'all are so quiet today. So let's not let the enemy win. Who's with me? Amen. Let's not let the enemy win. I'm so thankful that as of yet, whenever there's an issue, y'all feel comfortable enough to come to me and say, Brother Eric, this isn't going as well as, you know, or you forgot to do this, or maybe you need to do this. I am wide open for constructive criticism, amen? If you, if you have an idea or you think something's gonna make this better so we can reach more people for Christ, I am all ears. Those of you that know me know that's true. I'm not gonna get mad at you. If you come to me with a problem or an issue and say, Brother Eric, we need to address this, right? Whether it's with me or, or something else in the church, come to me, talk to me. Deacons have to have a Christ-like character. Scripture makes this clear. I've got it up on the board or up on the screen. Do you know what the questions are? We're almost done. The questions we need to ask when we're praying about who should serve as a deacon? Listen to some of these questions. Is this an honorable person? Is this person honorable? Is this a person that's genuine? It's not an act. They love God. They love people. They love helping. Is this a genuine person? Is this a person that's self-controlled? That's a big one. You ever been in a church business meeting where people behave real badly? That's a disgrace. That's a disgrace. If you're someone that can't hold your tongue or hold your temper in a deacon's meeting or a business meeting, or just in general, you don't need to be a deacon. You don't need to be a leader. You're not ready yet. I'm not saying you'll never be ready. I'm saying at that time, until you get that under control, by God's grace and with God's help, you're not ready to lead. It's important to understand too, and I gotta say this, we're not talking about perfection. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect, right? but are we shooting toward the, the goal? <laughs> are we shooting at the bullseye, right? Are we always gonna hit it? No, but are we aiming for it? Are we trying? Are we putting in the work? Are we putting in the effort, the prayers, the tears? Is this person a sacrificial giver? Is 
is this person, is this a person that's devoted to the word of God? They don't just say they love it, but they read it. They study it. They memorize it. They put it into practice in their life. They don't just tell everybody else what they need to do, but they set the example. Is this that kind of person? Is this a faithful person? Again, not perfect, but striving to be. Is this a person that honors Christ in their home? One thing that makes me sad personally is when I suddenly realize I'm being one way at church in front of all of you, but then when I'm at my house, I'm sinning. I hate that when I see that in my own life. Is this person a person that honors Christ in the home? So what have we what have we learned today from scripture? We've taken a look at what deacons are supposed to be biblically. We've talked about what they're not supposed to be, right? We talked about as we grow, we're going to need to appoint more deacons, right? Lord willing. Interestingly enough, and this is going to be, this is going to be an interesting one. Some of you may be asking the question right now, what about women? Can women be deacons? This is going to be interesting. So I was going to try to cram that into the last part of the sermon. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that because it's too important, right? So like anything else we do at, at Providence, we're a family, Right? We're family. We have a leadership team. And when we come to the hard things in Scripture, we tackle them as a family. Amen? We pray about these things. We search the Scriptures. We ask God for wisdom. And then where, wherever the church goes, whatever standards we set, uh, we agree on those as a church. Amen? Because honestly, there's, 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 a, lot, <laughs> there's a lot in there. And I'm going to do my best uh, just like I did with, you know, um, women in leadership at the church that we talked about earlier in Timothy. I'm going to tackle this with, uh, with that same vigor. Can I use that word? Miss Jane, you're a school teacher. Is vigor the right word? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go at it and do my best to present a clear case. There's basically two views, and we'll talk about those next week. Amen? So... How does this all apply to us? Every single one of us is under some kind of authority. Every one of us, right? We're to hold each other accountable. We need to be, we need to be godly servants, right? We're all, remember, we're all called to serve. We're all commanded to be servants to the glory of Christ. Are we going to do that? Or are we not going to do things the way God wants them done and just watch the church struggle or possibly even close its doors one day. We don't want that. I think it's safe to say everybody in this room would love to see Providence be just a beacon of light pointing straight to Christ for this community where people can say, I need, I need help, I need this, and somebody will say in the community, go to Providence. Amen. Someone saying, I feel lost, I feel hopeless, I, I don't want to live anymore. And someone can say, go to Providence. Not that Providence is the answer, but he is. He is. And if you're not prepared to share that with that person, there's nothing wrong. You know, it's always, it's always better if you can to just share the gospel right there in the moment. But if, but if there's a need... Um, and you can't meet it personally. There's a whole body of believers here that may know somebody. I mean, we can, and then God ultimately is the one that makes things happen. 
Amen. But let's do that. Let's be Christ-like. Let's be godly. If you're a leader at Providence, let's be a godly leader. Let's do exactly what we're supposed to be doing for the glory of God. If you're an elder, a deacon, whatever you end up being for God, a Sunday school teacher, youth worker, um, somebody that helps prepare food, you're all important. It's all important. Amen. Let's all stand and we're going to sing. Let's stand if you're able.